Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, today the general theme for our discussion is to be the psychology of sex. Who would like to raise the first question? Mr. Brandon, could you discuss the reasons why religion has always maintained a fundamentally hostile and condemnatory attitude towards sex? There are two things that you have to remember in order to understand the motives of religion's attitude towards sex. There are two premises at the root of religion which are very relevant here. One is the premise or the proposition that happiness or pleasure is evil. The other is the proposition or premise that man should regard himself as evil, or if not evil, then low, ignoble, and so forth. Both of these factors enter into the issue of sex. The essence of the religious attack on sex is the attack on pleasure. Sex, in their view, is evil precisely because sex entails pleasure. In fact, it entails the most intense form of pleasure possible for human beings to experience. But sex is more than that. Sex, by its very nature, involves an act of self-celebration. If people are to enter into sex, they do so on the premise that their purpose is to achieve enjoyment, is to achieve pleasure, is to achieve happiness, and that they are worthy of experiencing pleasure or happiness. Here is an act which you don't do to serve any higher cause. You don't do it for God, King, society, or the world at large. You do it for your own selfish pleasure, or you should. Except on that premise, man cannot even perform the sex act. So that implicit in the undertaking is the premise, I am important, I am worthy of enjoyment. I have a right to an act whose sole end is my pleasure. This contains the essence of sex as an act of self exaltation. Now the religious view which teaches man that he is to regard himself as unworthy necessarily has to deny him the right to an act of this kind precisely because it involves self-exaltation, precisely because its motive is the selfish pleasure of the participants. Thus we can see that the real intention of the religionist attack is to deny man the right to self-value, which means to deny him the right to self-esteem, and to deny him the experience of the pleasure, the enjoyment, the fulfillment of life here on earth, so that the religious attitude is anti-man, anti-self, anti-self-esteem, anti-pleasure, anti-life on earth. And that, I submit, is why it is so evil. Yes? In the light of your comments, what do you think of the modern rebellion against the religious view of sex and the movement towards a more a liberal and affirmative view to sex? Well, I think when we look at what is happening today culturally with regard to the attitude people exhibit towards sex, we can discern different themes, some of which are more welcome than others. Insofar as we are seeing a breaking away from the religious anti-sex puritanism of past centuries, I think we can all applaud what is happening. Unfortunately, that is not all that is happening today in people's minds and lives regarding the issue of sex. So often you see when there is a rebellion against something which is vicious or irrational, people swing to an alternative which is no less irrational but in a different way. And here the 
irrational alternative to which I refer is, of course, an absolutely mindless, promiscuous attitude toward sex, which divorces it from any question of seriousness, of moral or intellectual standards, which treats it, in effect, as a meaningless physical indulgence, and in so doing, by its implication, implies a view of sex that is no less degrading, no less irrational than the religious view in relationship to which it is thought to be a rebellion. So that I have very mixed feelings when I look at what is happening today. I am certainly all in favor of the greatly increased sexual enlightenment, the dissemination of information about sex. I am delighted when I see the changes in our legislation in the direction of a more rational and liberal attitude towards sex. On the other hand, when you see the cult of promiscuity, which is becoming so rampant today, with the profoundly anti-individualistic implications that it contains, there I am not enthusiastic. Now you might wonder, why do I say that the cult of promiscuity contains anti-individualistic implications? It does so because it necessarily implies a view of human beings as interchangeable. It denies the importance of the differences between people. It says, in effect, well, it doesn't matter who a person sleeps with. And I say it does make a difference. Sex is good. Sex is an immensely valuable experience. But sex and our sexual behavior should reflect our serious standards of value. It's not a meaningless, mindless, physical indulgence, unintegrated to and disconnected with the rest of our lives. When it becomes that, the meaning of sex as an experience becomes progressively impoverished, and the practitioners become neurotic or worsen the neurosis from which they already suffer, because then sex becomes escape. Sex becomes a means of building up the self-esteem they do not possess. Sex becomes a substitute gratification for every kind of frustration uh, from which they may be suffering. Sex today is, for many people, the universal anodyne, the universal placebo, the universal tranquilizer. Sex is not, by its nature, intended to be a substitute for alcohol or for milltown or, on the positive side, neither is it intended to be a substitute for self-esteem.